<clears throat> okay, so let me start sharing my screen. Okay, can uh, all of you hear me and see my screen? Yes, yes sir. One second. Sorry, my volume was low. Can you just repeat? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So let's begin. Uh, so this is lecture three. So in this lecture, we will primarily focus on the properties of, of quasars. Uh, we will discuss quasars first and in some detail. Uh, and the reason for that is that they exhibit many of the properties of AGN. Uh, after that, when we study other classes of AGN, such as uh, Seifert galaxies, for example, or radio galaxies, we will just compare and contrast their properties with, with quasars. And then uh, you'll be able to understand them quite better. This kind of approach is also important because uh, in the second half of the course, we are going to talk a lot about a theory called the Aegean unification theory. And there, uh, it's important to understand these properties uh, uh, in the way that I'm going to describe them so that we, we get an easier handle on the, on the unification uh, theory. <clears throat> okay, so uh, before we start, let's pose a question. So as you know that the positional uncertainty uh, that you get from radio telescopes uh, is single dish radio telescopes uh, is very large. And that is because the resolution uh, is given by 1.22 lambda by D and uh, the lambda of in the radio is about a million times larger than the lambda in the optical. So even if your radio dish is a big one, let's say a hundred meter dish, uh, nevertheless, your resolution is going to be poor because you, you're not, uh, uh, that the lambda factor hits you very hard. Uh, increasing D uh, doesn't help you much. So the positional uncertainty in the early surveys was of the order of arc minutes. Question is, how was it then possible to unambiguously identify optical counterparts to the radio source? Any thoughts? Um, sir, by observing the same patch of sky with optical telescopes. Yes, but the problem with uh, large positional uncertainty is, suppose your positional uncertainty is a few arc minutes. Okay. Uh, then uh, there may be five or 10 galaxies uh, within a few arc minutes of your position. So you don't know which is the optical counterpart. That is the problem. So we have to identify it unambiguously how to do that. We so want to look at... Go ahead. Uh, so by interferometry? Yes, but uh, at that time, you're right. Today, we will just do it via interferometry. But if you are sitting in 1960, uh, the interferometers that you have access to uh, have uh, uh, very short baselines. And they also, in the early days of radio astronomy, most of the telescopes used to operate at low radio frequencies, which means the lambda is large relatively. So that doesn't help you. So you can't use an interferometer. So we want to look for compact and luminous UV sources, right? So uh, if you find any compact UV. Uh, yes, but sometimes you can have uh, the, the three or four uh, uh, blue uh, compact sources. There may be stars, for example, or white dwarfs or something else, or even multiple quasars, one of which is uh, uh, emitting the radio emission that you see and the other is not. <laughs> so let me give you a hint. 
I don't think everybody is getting it. So the UT radio telescope effectively used this technique to identify a large number of quasars and other radio sources in the 1970s. Does that help? Okay, let me give you another hint, which is don't use the properties of your telescope. Think about the properties of the sky. Is there something in the sky that you can use? Okay, has, has anyone heard of the lunar occultation technique? Uh, yeah, so I have heard of this technique in which you, if a uh, radio, if a source is behind the lunar, says uh, lunar uh, behind the moon, so when moon eclipses, yes, so it uh, it blocks the uh, say it blocks at the source, and after when it comes to the edge, it re emits. We can uh, it started re emitting. Uh, we can see it re again. Reappear, so, correct. Reappear, yeah. Yes. So that is right. That's absolutely right. So uh, what one does is basically one doesn't know where the radio source is. So keep pointing, uh, uh, take observations when it that radio source is close to the moon. Okay. Of course, which means that you cannot do this technique for radio sources that are in parts of the sky where the moon never goes. Okay. The moon is about within about five degrees of the ecliptic at all times. Uh, it uh, does not uh, move much more than that. So uh, one is of course limited in that way, but within that limitation, you use the technique that Manish just described. You wait for the radio source to disappear. Okay, When it disappears, you know that it has to be on one circular locus. It can't be anywhere else. And then when it reappears again, it is uh, on some other circular locus and you know how the earth is rotating and using that information and the time of when it reappeared and when it, when it disappeared and reappeared. And of course, we, at that time, we knew the orbit of the moon very precisely. So, so we knew the exact position of the moon in the sky. Uh, using these kind of lunar occultation techniques, people were able to identify uh, unambiguously the optical counterpart because you got the right ascension and the declination of the radio source very accurately and then you could easily identify the optical counterpart. So 3C273, the first quasar was identified, uh, the optical counterpart was identified via lunar occultation. And uh, as, I, as I said here, the UT radio telescope uh, it used this technique for observations of literally hundreds of uh, quasars, radio galaxies and pulsars and got very accurate positions for them and thereby allowing for finding of optical counterparts and then through optical spectroscopy, a redshift. So one must remember that a radio source without a redshift is quite useless because you're, you can measure fluxes in various bands, etc. But unless you can convert the flux to a physical quantity uh, such as luminosity, it becomes impossible to use it for any useful science. So therefore, it is quite critical for one to get a redshift of a radio source. And the most simple way that we know of finding the redshift of a radio source is to find its optical counterpart and get a spectrum of that optical counterpart. And why is this? Because uh, unlike the optical uh, part of the spectrum, which is very rich in emission and absorption lines, the radio uh, spectrum is very sparse in lines. There are hardly any lines. And therefore, it becomes very, very difficult to obtain a redshift uh, for uh, a radio source using radio data alone. Okay. <clears throat> right. So the first quasar, as we have seen in the last lecture, was discovered in 1963. And uh, what is shown in this uh, figure 
there are two lines. The dashed line is showing you the uh, heterogeneous quasar catalog, the number of quasars in different heterogeneous quasar catalogs. So what used to happen was that there used to be large surveys attempted uh, by large homogeneous surveys. And uh, there would also be, <clears throat> but each of these surveys would not be very large. So suppose I did a homogeneous survey, I had 100 quasars, and you guys did another survey, you had 200 quasars, and so on. So the total number of quasars that we observed may be 300, but the largest homogeneous set may just be 100. And that was the situation till... <clears throat> so if you see the largest homogeneous source, uh, homogeneous catalog is uh, in 1990 is about uh, just over uh, a few or maybe a few hundred this is a log scale and even the most heterogeneous catalog was not uh, not much over a thousand all the quasars known together so what are these heterogeneous catalogs there were some people uh, 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 Veron Seti is one of them and uh, uh, there are, there were a few others these people used to compile the information of all known quasars uh, discovered by different people using uh, different telescopes and different techniques. And they used to create a catalog. And they used to update that catalog uh, periodically with all, all known quasar information. So those triangles represent those heterogeneous catalogs. And you can see that by after 2000, uh, something dramatic happened. And that, of course, was the advent of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the number of quasars went very rapidly from 10 raised to 4 uh, to 10 raised to 6. And uh, there is a caution here because these are not all spectroscopically confirmed. So by the year 2000, we had more than or about a million quasar candidates, uh, but not all of them had been spectroscopically confirmed. But over the last decade, uh, many of these have been spectroscopically confirmed. And as we shall see in a few minutes, the total number of quasars known today is about 750,000. So three quarters of a million quasars are known today. Uh, this is another uh, representation now showing only the number of uh, quasars that have been discovered uh, by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Okay, so what is shown here in cyan color is the number of quasars uh, discovered by the SDSS uh, in the first eight years of its operation. Right? Uh, uh, these are the units are uh, 10 raised to 5, so uh, 100,000. So as you can see, uh, until about January 2010, the number of quasars that had been discovered were reasonably modest. They were of the order of uh, 100,000. Uh, but over the last 10 years or so, that number has uh, very dramatically increased. And in this paper, which was published in 2018, the total number of quasars known is about 500,000, right? Uh, it has now gone to 750,000 in the last uh, couple of years. This represents a very, very dramatic increase in numbers, which also represents very quickly, as we shall see later on towards the end of this talk, a very dramatic improvement in our understanding of uh, quasar properties. Uh, and that's primarily because now we, we are not limited by uh, small number statistics. And uh, because of that, statistical biases in the sample are also very well uh, understood. It becomes possible to uh, <clears throat> actually correct for some of the biases. And also, since you're not uh, limited by small, uh, small number statistics, the noise in your measurement is, is, is much smaller. And therefore, your resu results are much more reliable. Uh, the different colors indicate, indicate different uh, phases of the SDSS. So there was SDSS phase one and phase two, uh, which uh, uh, whose goal was to discover uh, 100,000 quasars. They sort of nearly managed that.
But then in SDSS 3 and SDSS 4, uh, they actually changed their strategy uh, for discovering quasars. And they could do that because they, uh, they upgraded the spectrographs uh, that were there on the, SDA, on the SDSS telescope. And that allowed them to discover quasars, uh, much fainter quasars. Uh, and therefore, many of them were also more distant quasars, higher redshift quasars were discovered in uh, SDSS-3 and SDSS-4. Uh, we know about 10 raised to 6 quasars now, let's say, and these are distributed over 10 raised to 4 uh, square degrees. So today we have knowledge of about 100 quasars per square degree at a variety of redshifts. And this is, becomes very crucial in studies of the intergalactic medium, which I'm sure Sri Anand uh, will uh, talk about. And there, because you have so many lines of sight, you have a million lines of sight, you have 10 lines, uh, you have a hundred lines of sight per square degree, uh, you can actually map, you can map the properties of the intergalactic medium by using the quasar's uh, light as background illumination and looking for absorption line systems along the line of sight. So things that were completely unthinkable 20, 25 years ago are now routinely uh, done using, uh, using quasars. Okay, so the latest release of the SDSS quasar catalog. So the SDSS has uh, <clears throat> approximately one new release every year. So the most recent release is called uh, data release 16. And in this particular data release, uh, which is a catalog, uh, uh, they have uh, released the largest quasar catalog to date, containing da uh, data on 750,000 quasars, of which as many as, as 225,000 are new in this data release. So nearly a third of the quasars known have been discovered in the last uh, year or two. <clears throat> it turns out that more than 90% of these <clears throat> have very faint or undetectable radio emission, right? So this we already knew because we are uh, doing optical selections. Many of them don't have uh, radio emission, but they still have a blue continuum and strong broad emission lines. Okay. So what is the redshift distribution of uh, uh, quasars that are known? Uh, that is represented by this black line, uh, thick black line, which is there. And what is shown in the different colors are the quasars that were discovered by uh, the different components of, of the Sloan survey, right? Now, uh, we talk of quasars and Sloan survey in the same breath because I think about 90% of all quasars known were discovered by this single survey. Uh, as you can see in SDSS-1, which was the first component of the Sloan survey, uh, they, uh, they had a certain uh, candidate selection strategy, uh, which helped them discover a lot of quasars up to a redshift of two or so. And after that, they found only a handful. Okay, but nevertheless, they did find a number of quasars uh, at redshift uh, higher than six. And as we shall see uh, for some interesting cosmological reasons, uh, that is very important. Uh, in SDSS uh, three, they changed their strategy. They said that we should have a separate strategy for finding low redshift quasars and a separate strategy for finding high redshift quasars. And so they, uh, they actually managed that. They found a lot of quasars uh, that's indicated by the purple line here. They found a lot of quasars at redshift less than one, but they also found many, many quasars between redshifts uh, uh, two and four or so. In the third, uh, on the, in SDSS four, they decided to change their strategy again. They said that we are missing uh, a lot of quasars uh, in the redshift range one to two. So they changed their selection strategy and they found uh, now have found uh, many quasars between 
redshift one and two. And why is this important? This is important because the peak of the quasar phenomenon uh, is expected to occur at a redshift of two or so. Uh, therefore, after uh, redshift two, which means at lower redshifts, uh, there should be a steep fall in the, uh, there should be a steep evolution in the luminosity function of quasars, and there should be a steep fall in the, uh, in the uh, co-moving uh, density of the quasar population. Right. Okay. So we have said already that quasars are very strong emitters at all bands. So what is represented here is uh, across going all the way from radio waves to gamma rays uh, frequencies on the x axis. Uh, what is the luminosity of uh, the quasar uh, 3C273? We keep using this quasar because it is one of the nearest quasars and it's fairly luminous. It is not the most luminous quasar, but it has been studied for more than 50 years and we know a lot about this quasar. Uh, so we measured using different telescopes. We've gone and measured the, uh, the luminosity. The luminosity is in terms of new L nu. So uh, normally, if you think, uh, if you take a flux and in Jansky and convert it into a luminosity, you will get uh, a luminosity which is in watts per hertz. Uh, but what is done here while plotting this diagram, you uh, you integrate over uh, every frequency interval, and uh, so therefore that per hertz goes away, and so the power will uh, come out in watts. And you compare that with the power of the sun at the same uh, frequency band uh, with the power of the sun also integrated in a similar way. So you convert basically uh, just like you have a flux density, which is uh, watts per meter square per hertz. Uh, you have a luminosity density, which is uh, uh, watts per hertz. And here you have a true luminosity. You remove that hertz by integrating out. And as you can see that across from all the way from radio to gamma, uh, the quasar is much, much brighter than the, uh, than the CD galaxy that is also shown here. Uh, does anyone know what is a CD galaxy? Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, sir. I don't know. Huh. Okay, fine. So, uh, yeah, if I don't, <laughs> you can at least say that we can't, uh, we don't know or we, uh, we are hearing you, etc. Because sometimes I'm confused. Okay. Uh, so, a CD galaxy is, uh, uh, so if you have studied clusters, you would remember that very often at the centers of clusters, you find extremely luminous uh, galaxies. These are almost always elliptical galaxies. So there will be a giant elliptical galaxy sitting at the core of every <coughs> evolved cluster. Okay, by evolved, I mean a cluster <coughs> that is realized and is not in a merging state. Sometimes you have clus two clusters which are merging together. But if it's not like that, if it is realized, if it's relaxed, uh, then at the center of uh, that cluster, you will invariably find a, a, a galaxy, a big, bright elliptical galaxy, which is known as a CD galaxy. And why is the CD galaxy shown here? Because in terms of its total uh, mass, uh, it's, and very often its total luminosity, these are the most uh, massive and most luminous uh, galaxy systems known. So they don't want you to even compare with Milky Way. They say we'll compare with CD galaxy, which is very big and very bright and so on. Uh, let's uh, see how that compares with the quasar. And as you can see, the CD galaxy, of course, peaks in the infrared because uh, it's uh, dominated. Its stellar population is dominated by old stars, uh, which uh, emit more uh, in the near infrared than they do in the optical but it does have a fair amount of emission in the optical as well and a little bit of emission in the radio. 
uh, so this comparison was made just to show you that uh, even if you take the most bright luminous galaxy known and compare it with a quasar, the quasar beats it hands down, right? Uh, in every wave band, there is no, no real comparison. Okay, so, uh, so if you look at the spectral energy distribution of the quasar, uh, we've represented that here uh, with uh, the blue bump, right? And what, what is the blue bump? The blue bump is caused by extremely strong UV and optical emission that is coming from the hottest parts of the accretion disk uh, close to the event horizon of the supermassive black hole. Now, the amount of X-ray and gamma ray emission uh, that is there in, uh, uh, in quasars is quite strongly variable. So that's why there is a line, that solid line that is shown there and a dashed line, which is also shown there which indicates that, look, it can vary uh, quite a bit by an order of magnitude or even more. If you come to the uh, radio side, uh, there, is, uh, there are these radio quiet quasars, which have very, very low emission in the radio bands. But of course, there are also a few radio loud quasars and 3C273, uh, definitely belongs in that category. For these quasars, the uh, radio luminosity can be many orders of magnitude higher than the uh, luminosity of the radio quiet quasars, especially at the uh, frequencies of about a gigahertz or less. So you can see there uh, gigahertz would be 10 raised to 9 hertz. Uh, over here. And as you can see, if you just extrapolate these lines, the radio loud quasars are going to be many, 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 perhaps a million times brighter uh, than the uh, radio quiet quasars. So these are the broad features of the spectral energy distribution of quasars. Now we are going to, over the next few minutes, uh, dig in a little bit deeper and look at the uh, at regions of the optical spectrum of, uh, of quasars and see uh, what the main properties there are. Okay. Sir? Yeah. So from the this previous plot, from uh, the dotted line, does yes. it mean that radio loud galaxies are also loud in X-ray and gamma rays? Or it's not no, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. It is uh, just, it's not the same objects here which are bright there. No, not necessary. Okay. They can be, but there is no uh, strong correlation. As we shall see, many of these things are also uh, affected by relativistic beaming. Uh, so if you have a strong uh, beaming, so there are there is a, in fact a class of special class of quasars which are known as blazars, and they have the property that the radio jet is uh, directed almost exactly along our line of sight. And because of that, they, uh, the flux is, uh, is uh, relativistically boosted and uh, you see very strong uh, emission and also very strong variability because if the, uh, if the uh, direction of, so these are very, of course, relativistic uh, jets. So the uh, Lorentz factors are very high. And if the direction of the beam changes slightly, uh, there can be a dramatic fall in flux. If it is pointed exactly at you and then it changes direction, let's say by 0 0.01 degrees, uh, there can be a very dramatic fall in flux. So those are, are different. So there are, there are quasars which are very bright uh, uh, in the radio as well as uh, in X-ray and gamma ray. But there are also quasars which are uh, very bright in one of them, but not bright in the other. So both possibilities exist all four possibilities exist. Right. Okay. So, so this uh, shown here uh, is uh, 
uh, something known as a composite uh, quasar spectrum. So I forgot forgot to cite the paper when I put out the slides. I will I will add that in. So some years ago, people said that it would be really useful if we have a sort of average uh, spectrum of uh, quasars. So Vandenberg et al. took on this responsibility. And I think in 2001, if I remember correctly, uh, they published this paper uh, wherein they uh, said, let's just take all the SDSS quasars that we've observed so far and add co-add their spectra together so that we know what is the average property of a quasar. Okay, so this, this is not a spectrum of a single quasar. It is what is called a composite quasar spectrum, which is a sort of averaged uh, quasar spectrum. This is useful because it tells you which kind of lines uh, dominate uh, in which domain. So for example, uh, you can see that the uh, MG2 line with at 2798 angstroms, uh, that seems to be a fairly bright line, okay? Uh, similarly, the, the C3 line or the C4 line at 1549 Armstrongs, <clears throat> uh, that also is a fairly bright line. Uh, you can also see that there are uh, lines here which are uh, very, very uh, strong. There are other lines which are relatively weak. You can also see that there are some lines which are very, very broad. Okay, so the C4 line is an example or the Lyman alpha line that you see at 12, 16 uh, uh, angstroms, uh, that also is, uh, is fairly broad. But towards the right, if you look at uh, uh, 03, uh, 4959 and 5007, uh, this is known as the O3 doublet. These lines are, uh, are usually weaker, of course, than uh, C4 or Lyman alpha, but they're also quite narrow, okay? So, uh, so a quasar spectrum uh, typically contains both broad lines as well as narrow lines and a generally blue continuum. So if you look at the, the slope of the underlying continuum emission, between say 2000 and 4000 angstroms, uh, that slope is always negative, uh, indicating that uh, it is basically a very blue object. In fact, that's how we find quasars. And uh, uh, that also is a characteristic property of quasars. We look at uh, the detailed properties of this spectrum uh, in a few minutes, but before we go there, a few things. Uh, what are forbidden lines in a spectrum? Okay, so forbidden lines uh, are actually, it's a, quite a misnomer to call them forbidden because nothing forbidden about them, but they are essentially highly improbable lines and they cannot be uh, detected in a lab experiment. So suppose you take fill hydrogen, uh, and in, uh, in, in your lab uh, and just try to look for emission absorption uh, from that hydrogen, uh, you will see a certain set of lines, okay? Uh, with other gases, like if you take oxygen, for example, uh, you will not see a certain uh, set of lines and they require special conditions to occur in sufficient numbers to be detected, okay? So what, what do you think are the most common astrophysical situations which are very difficult to reproduce in a lab? By uh, astrophysical conditions, I mean the basic physical parameters, pressure, temperature, et cetera. Like high temperature and high pressure. Yes. So high temperature is also not that difficult because you can heat gases to fairly high temperatures in, uh, in plasma laboratories, for example, they can heat, uh, uh, reach very high temperatures. So we know a little bit about the properties of very hot gas, uh, even through lab experiments. Uh, but there's something else where we know a little uh, about. 
So low density reason? Yes. So extremely low density gas. Okay. And we routinely encounter this. So even if you go to a sort of what we consider a gas rich region, you go to the center of the Orion Nebula, you think there's a lot of gas there. But the density of the gas is extremely low. The kinetic temperatures may be high, okay, but the density and consequently the pressure of the gas is very, very low. But why is it that we are still able to detect this gas uh, uh, in, uh, with a telescope, but we cannot detect the gas uh, in the lab? Due to the high number of the particles present, there is a high probability of like uh, very low probable uh, transitions. Yes, because we see, remember, in a lab, you may build a, a hydrogen container, which is 10 meters in diameter or 100 meters in diameter, right? But if you lower the density very much of the hydrogen inside, so that there are only like few atoms per uh, cubic meter, you will detect not, no transitions at all. But very often in astronomy, when we are looking through the interstellar medium or we are looking through the intergalactic medium, we are effectively integrating over very, very large, long lines of sight. And along that line of sight, you will have sufficient number of atoms uh, that will um, undergo these highly improbable transitions and still get detected. So low densities uh, are the predominant uh, situation in astronomy from which you can get these uh, forbidden lines. So forbidden lines were uh, first discovered in uh, H2 regions. Okay, Of course, these forbidden lines initially caused some surprise about what are these lines? Because we don't, you have a lab spectrum of all the gases that you know about and uh, you can't uh, see the, uh, the transition, right? Because that's supposed to be forbidden. Then in quantum mechanics, they worked out what are called these so-called selection rules, which tell you which lines are forbidden and which lines are, are permitted or allowed. And there, of course, these uh, selection rules use certain approximations about the electric dipole moment of the atom or the uh, quadrupole moment, the magnetic moment and so on. If you relax those, if you, if you uh, relax those assumptions, which means you don't strictly s s assume that those assumptions are correct, then it becomes uh, possible for forbidden lines to exist. The only thing is, of course, they will be much less probable uh, than uh, uh, than the permitted lines, and therefore they're generally weaker. Okay. Does anyone know, uh, give me some examples of permitted lines? Where the probability of the transition happening is quite high. Uh, what about the H alpha line? It's permitted. Yeah, it's a permitted. What about Lyman alpha? It's also permitted. That's also permitted. Lyman beta, everything is permitted, all those, all, all those transitions. Uh, forbidden lines. Uh, uh, does anyone know any example of forbidden lines? Like 2H to 1S. Uh, 2H to 1S, yes. Anything else? 21 centimeter line. 21 centimeter line. That is uh, really very nice. Yes. So the 21 centimeter line, which represents a hyperfine transition, hyperfine because the energy levels are very, very subtly different between the spin up and the spin down uh, configuration of the hydrogen atom. The proton and electron spins are aligned. Uh, the, the, uh, the atom is in a slightly higher energy state than when the uh, spin of the proton and the electron are uh, not aligned. I mean, they're not the same, they're opposite. Uh, in that case, the so when it transitions, when the spin flips, uh, so it's called a spin flip transition. Uh, when that happens, a very, very tiny amount of energy is emitted in the form of a photon, which is appears in the radio at a 
wavelength of approximately 21 centimeters. So it's called the 21 centimeter line. And that is most definitely a forbidden line. If you are sitting looking at one atom waiting for it to transition, you will have to, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's of the order of million years before that spin flip happens. But because hydrogen is the most abundant element uh, in the universe, and we are integrating over long lines of sight, it becomes possible for us to detect uh, H1 uh, both in emission as well as in absorption. But that, that's of course in the radio. So, uh, so remember the, the transition that we talked about, the hydrogen 21 centimeter line, uh, do not involve any change in the principal quantum number, right? These are uh, changes that are in the spin state of the hydrogen atom. There are also a number of forbidden lines in ro rotational transitions of molecules, and these have somewhat uh, intermediate energy between H1, uh, 21 centimeter and uh, forbidden lines in the optical. And these give line, uh, rise to a number of lines in the submillimeter and millimeter bands. Of course, there are permitted transitions there also. So by forbidden, one means forbidden atomic transitions, forbidden uh, molecular transitions, and of course, atomic and ionic transitions as well. Okay. So very often you will uh, hear uh, uh, quasar astronomers talk about lines uh, as if they are their friends and they all know the wavelengths of all of those lines and uh, you show them a spectrum and they'll say this is C4, that's Lyman alpha, this is if it uh, three or whatever, right? I am not that familiar with uh, spectroscopy. So I can't guess the line just by looking at a spectrum, but now we'll go look at the uh, uh, UV optical and a little bit into the near infrared spectrum of a quasar. So now again, like uh, this is in fact the same spectrum that I showed you previously, which is the composites uh, quasar spectrum that you see here. But what has been done is we've sort of zoomed in uh, to different uh, wavelength intervals so that we see the lines more clearly. And the lines themselves have been labeled. So again, this, this figure is also drawn from that paper from Vandenberg et al. Uh, and here you can see uh, the ultraviolet spectrum of the galaxy. So you can see the Lyman alpha line there uh, is the most prominent feature of the, of the spectrum, right? Now, what is the wavelength of the Lyman alpha line? Uh, 1215 angstrom. Correct. Yeah, 1216 12, angstrom. And at about 900 uh, angstroms, the uh, lines, the flux seems to fall down quite precipitously. Okay. Does anyone know uh, what is that uh, limit called? Lyman break. Yeah, the Lyman break or uh, the Lyman limit, right? And uh, uh, does anyone know what's the wavelength of that? Uh, 912 angstrom, I guess. I don't know exactly. Correct. That's absolutely right. 912 angstroms uh, is the wavelength uh, of uh, the Lyman break. It's also called as the Lyman limit. Okay. Uh, after that, it's basically any photon with higher energy will immediately ionize a hydrogen, any hydrogen atom that it encounters. So because hydrogen is so widespread in the universe, uh, it becomes very difficult for photons that have slightly higher energy than the ionization energy. So the, a photon of 912 angstrom's wavelength has uh, 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 how much energy will it have in electron volt? 13.6. Yeah, 13.6 electron volts, right? That's the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom. So that's what uh, is uh, it happens, that the, the photons get ionized. So it's very hard for us to see any emission 
at wavelengths uh, immediately shorter of uh, 912 angstroms. Right. So there is on the right side of Lyman alpha, uh, we see a number of lines, carbon two, carbon four, uh, silicon uh, four and so on. Uh, would you say the carbon four is a narrow line or a broad line? Broad. Yeah, it's a very broad line. So is Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha is also a very broad line. Right? Now, a uh, blue world uh, of uh, or at shorter wavelengths of Lyman alpha, shorter wavelengths than the Lyman alpha 1269 storms, you see a lot of the spectrum has suddenly become very noisy. Why is that? Is it the Lyman alpha forest? Yes, that's absolutely right. And what causes the Lyman alpha forest? Um, we have I, IGM at different redshifts in between. The yes. Yes. It absorbs at different wavelengths. Yes. So different uh, IGMs or maybe even big galaxies that are in the line of sight between us and the quasar, they will absorb, since they contain hydrogen, uh, they will absorb uh, the photon, uh, the Lyman alpha photon that they see. Okay, but at different redshifts, they see it at uh, different energies, and therefore the absorption that we see uh, is also happens at at different wavelengths or at different energy levels. Okay, uh, this of course is in the domain of uh, studies of the intergalactic medium. I'm sure Sri Anand will talk a lot about uh, the Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so let's go now uh, from the far UV spectrum. So this is uh, in the far UV band of uh, spectrum of quasars. Let's look at the near UV uh, spectrum of the quasar. Okay, and uh, uh, which is the big dominant line that you see here? Carbon three, uh, silicon three, silicon three, carbon three, Fe three. They're sort of all merged together. Uh, over there, right? And uh, but there is uh, clearly a falling continuum, like we saw in the uh, in the far alpha uh, ultraviolet uh, red world of the Lyman alpha line. And there are a number of other metal metal lines. Now it turns out that this iron atom has a lot of uh, transitions. Uh, involving Fe2 mostly and sometimes Fe3 uh, in the uh, near ultraviolet band. So if you want to study the uh, 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 the properties using of quasars using a, a near uh, UV telescope, then you will frequently en encounter various species of ion lines many of which are overlapping. So only the sort of main lines are shown here, but just like you have uh, a Lyman alpha forest, which is basically overlapping hydrogen uh, lines in absorption, uh, here you have overlapping ion lines in emission. Uh, you would also notice here that if you look at the other elements except iron, right? They are all elements that are in the early part of the periodic table. In, within the first 15, 20 elements, they are there, right? But iron is a little bit removed. It's a relatively uh, heavy uh, uh, atom, uh, which is uh, which is which uh, produces lots of lines uh, within this region. Now we go on. Now we go into the optical uh, domain. Uh, here, uh, which is the most dominant line? Uh, magnesium 2. Magnesium 2. Okay. So, magnesium is one element uh, which, is, uh, which is quite abundant uh, uh, in the universe. And the Mg2 line is a very, very strong line, uh, both in emission and also in absorption. So, there are people, for example, who, like Neeraj Gupta at Ayuka, for example, 
who uh, who study these absorb uh, they study the IgM using a magnesium two absorbers. So just like uh, Lyman alpha absorbers will give you uh, objects in the Lyman alpha forest uh, by studying Mg two absorbers. Uh, which of course will occur in different bands depending on what the redshift uh, you are looking at, uh, you can uh, study the properties of the uh, IgM. Okay. We go further on. So here again, you notice that there is uh, a quite a gap between the continuum uh, best fit line, which is shown by that dashed line, and the actual spectrum. So why is the continuum sort of not lining up with the, with the bottom of the, the lines? The reason for that is twofold. Uh, one, uh, I told you that lots of these iron lines which continue uh, even up to about 4,000 angstroms. So these overlapping iron emission lines are, are producing that extra emission. So it's not continuum emission, but it is emission from overlapping uh, iron lines. But there are other lines which are uh, beginning to overlap in this domain. Okay, so what could those be? Where would be the Balmer lines be? Okay, let me ask this another way. The Lyman limit is at 912 angstroms. What is the Balmer limit going to be at? I think some 4,000. Yes, 4, but 000. can you calculate it exactly? Yes. Yes. So remember the Balmer line is a transition from uh, the n equal to two state upwards, right? Or from any upward state to n equal to two. The Lyman is transitioned to n equal to one. Three, six, four, eight. Three, six, four, eight. That's correct because the, uh, the the uh, ionization energy of the hydrogen atom is 13.6 electron volt. That corresponds to 912 angstrom. And uh, uh, this is a transition from, so you have this in your formula, right? One over N1 square minus one over N2 square into the Friedberg's constant, etc. So that N2 square will be one fourth. So the energy of uh, 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 Balmer alpha or the Balmer limit uh, is going to be one fourth the energy of the uh, Lyman limit. So the uh, wavelength will be four times higher. Frequency will be four times lower, right? So that is 3,648 angstroms. So which is appears towards the right of this figure. So over here, you have lots of blending lines because remember that uh, the distance between uh, H alpha and H beta line is quite large, but the distance between H beta and H gamma is smaller, right? Between H gamma and H delta is even smaller and so on. So in the end, you have lots and lots of the Balmer series lines, uh, which are seen in emission. They're quite weak, but they're enough to push the line above the uh, continuum. Okay, so we go further on and now we are looking at the uh, optical spectrum again. Let me see if there's one more, there is one more, yeah. So uh, what are the, uh, you see one very, very strong but relatively narrow line. Uh, this is the O3 line, right? And uh, then, uh, any other thing that is, H, of course, H beta is is uh, is quite strong. Uh, it's at about uh, 
4,800 and something uh, angstroms. And there is this relatively narrow O3 line. Uh, there is also the O2 line, which I should mention, uh, which is in the previous plot. So this line is also very commonly seen. Uh, O2 represents a, a forbidden line. Uh, it's at 3727 angstroms. And uh, O2 is uh, relatively weak because it's a for forbidden line, but it's quite commonly seen in, in many, many emission line uh, spectra of quasars, not just quasars, but you can also see it in the, uh, in the spectra of H2 uh, regions, ionized hydrogen regions within our galaxy. And, uh, and similarly, the O3 lines, there are two lines. There is one at, I think, 5007 angstroms and one at 4958 or 4959 angstroms. So th this is known, referred to as the O3 doublet. These are also forbidden transitions, but again, uh, uh, quite commonly seen. Right. Uh, now we go uh, into the infrared bands, and there the, now the number of lines uh, uh, reduces. Uh, the most prominent line here, of course, is the H alpha line. And the H alpha line uh, is, is surrounded on both sides by two nitrogen lines, which are referred to as the N2 doublet. And one of the N2 doublet, so uh, uh, the wavelength of H alpha is 6563 angstroms. And on both sides, a little bit higher wavelength and a little bit lower wavelength, you see the N2 doublet. And because of that, the uh, measuring the, the strength of the H alpha line uh, in quasars is often very tricky because uh, it is in, almost invariably accompanied by uh, by the N2 line. So you basically have to model this as the sum of like three Gaussians, one for each of the N2 lines and one Gaussian for the H alpha. Anyway, right. Now, so this was the composite uh, quasar spectrum, right? Uh, but uh, there is also uh, this in this figure now is shown a spectrum of a high redshift quasar. And this spectrum was obtained with the Keck and the redshift of the quasar is very high. It's uh, 6.43. And the claim made is, is that in this spectrum, you can see evidence for the Gunn-Peterson trough. What is the Gunn-Peterson trough? Um, sir, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. This maybe has been covered in your cosmology. But in your cos if you remember your cosmology or the history of the universe since the Big Bang, there was the Big Bang when the universe was fully ionized, right? And after about, uh, after some time, about uh, 400,000 years or so, uh, was the epoch uh, when the universe became neutral. Okay, it is the last scattering surface. There was decoupling between radiation and matter and the universe became neutral, which means electrons and protons came together, formed hydrogen atoms, right? Uh, and that was the state of the universe for a very long time until what happened? How did the universe get reionized? I think things started collapsing and then like stars formed and then Correct. UV photons. Correct. That's right. So uh, uh, the hydrogen gas collapsed from stars, maybe from quasars in the early universe. And uh, that led to a copious amount of uh, UV radiation getting emitted, which began to ionize uh, the hydrogen around it. So now the question was that if you look sufficiently at uh, distant quasars, then you should begin to see 
uh, very, very strong absorption uh, uh, beyond the Lyman limit, which means that the Lyman limit is, of course, a limit. You'd see little flux, but you should see essentially zero flux uh, beyond the Lyman limit uh, because of the in a, because the, the, the universe at that redshift is, is neutral, right? If it is fully neutral, then not one photon will, will get through because it will eventually uh, encounter, every UV photon will encounter a, a, a hydrogen atom and get absorbed, right? So that was a prediction made by Gunn and Peterson in a paper in 1965. And they predicted that if you observe a quasar, which is sitting not in the reionized uh, region of the universe, but is sitting at a stage when the universe was slightly neutral, then you should see a dramatic fall uh, in its flux because it's now having to pass through, uh, through neutral hydrogen rather than ionized hydrogen. And uh, that is what they, they predicted and uh, it was in fact discovered uh, with one of these, uh, these quasars. And this I think is the highest redshift quasar known in, uh, in 2001 or so when these observations were obtained. And it was uh, obtained uh, with the quasar was discovered with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, although this high quality spectrum was later on obtained with the Keck telescope, which is a much bigger and more powerful telescope. But it's interesting because the, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is the brainchild of Jim Gunn, who as a PhD student uh, uh, wrote the uh, Gunn-Peterson paper in 1965. And then in the year 2000 or 2001, uh, he built uh, a telescope uh, which allowed them to actually make this discovery. So Jim Gunn therefore is, is quite unique in the sense that he is uh, an excellent theorist. Uh, he's an excellent observer. And most importantly, he's an excellent instrumentation builder. So he built and he designed uh, the entire S, uh, SDSS telescope. And he also uh, designed and built the imaging camera for the for the SDSS. And then he used that to sort of test a prediction that he himself had made uh, 35 years ago. So it's quite remarkable. Okay, so before we end, just some closing remarks. Uh, so we've seen that broadly, if you look at the optical spectrum of uh, quasar, then blue word of the Lyman alpha line you see lots and lots of hydrogen absorbers. Some of the absorption may be weak, okay? But some of it may be very strong. So suppose you have a galaxy, which is sitting right exactly in between us and the background quasar, then there will be a lot of, naturally there'll be a lot of gas in the galaxy. And there consequently, there will be a lot of absorption that you will see at the, uh, redshift of the galaxy. So again, these are things that will be covered in detail in your IGM course. But one thing that I want you to note is that if there is a galaxy which is rich in metal lines, right, then you can also see metal absorption lines in the spectrum of the quasar, right? Because these metal absorption lines are not coming from the quasar itself, which is producing emission lines. But these are coming from the metal rich galaxy that is sitting in between us and the quasar. So some, in some quasars, you can uh, study uh, uh, absorption lines, uh, uh, red word of the Lyman alpha line uh, coming from metals, uh, which come from intervening galaxies. So as I uh, uh, said uh, a bit earlier, uh, we, we have now 750,000 lines of sight in different directions. Some of those lines of sight are short because the quasar is at uh, low redshift. 
but many are very long. And now we have quasars going up beyond uh, redshift seven or so. So these are enormously gigaparsecs, uh, many, many gigaparsecs, uh, hundreds of gigaparsecs long uh, lines of sight that allow us to study not just the very distant quasar itself, but use the bright light of the quasar to illuminate everything that stands in between us and the quasar and study absorbers uh, uh, in the, along the line of sight. In the early days, I mean, in the pre-Sloan days, people, uh, the number of absorbers known was sufficiently small that people sort of knew every absorber by name or number. Now, with so many quasars and so many possible absorbers per quasar, you have to create a very large catalog of, of absorb absorbers in order to uh, study them, understand them. And this has become a very big industry. At the highest rate shift, uh, the highest redshift quasars, for example, those at quasars at redshift seven or so, can be used to model exactly how the, by studying their spectrum, by looking at the presence or absence of the gunn peterson trough, one can get some inkling of the state of the universe towards the end of the uh, neutral phase and when everything was getting reionized. So, one can get some idea, some observational inkling, whether reionization happened all at once everywhere, or it took some time. There was a phase in which the universe was partly ionized and partly neutral for, for some period of time. All that these are open questions, but observations of quasars uh, enable us to uh, study and analyze uh, such questions. So I'll stop here. Are there any questions on the material we've covered today? Sir, hello. Yeah. Sir, in some uh, spectral lines, we are putting some square brackets. Sir, why is it so? What are they representing? Uh, what are they representing? Uh, I think uh, they are. Square brackets are used, I, I think they're used for ions. Uh, I don't uh, recollect clearly, but normally square brackets are used for ionized uh, species. They haven't been used in this plot. Yes. Over here, uh, they know that's not correct because maybe it's uh, used for metal lines. I'm sorry. I think it's used for metal lines, right? So if it's a line of hydrogen or helium, uh, you don't put the square bracket, okay? But if it is iron or oxygen or nitrogen or basically anything else except hydrogen or helium, uh, you put uh, put the square bracket. It's a line in ferrous too. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there should be a line there. There should be a, a, a square bracket there. I think that since ferrous two is occurring so many times, I think they have not. Uh, they have neglected to put the square bracket. But yeah. sir, sir, in some places, they have only put only one square bracket like earlier. Yes. So, in some places, they have put two. Uh, some places, they put open and close and in some places, they only put close bracket. No, no, no. Then that is a typo. It should be open. If you want to put, you have to put open and close, both of them. Yes. So that may be just a typo, but as you can see, the hydrogen lines don't have, helium lines don't have the square bracket. But I'll, I'll check. I mean, this is a very, very good question. See, over here, for example, Fe2, they put a square bracket and they haven't put for the other two lines. Yes. Those are yes. also Fe2 transitions. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, put up this talk also on the website. Uh, so we will meet again on Monday. I've also made recordings for uh, all of my talks. So in case uh, I'll put up the links to the recording, I have to figure out how to give you the links. But 
uh, if uh, any of you misses a class uh, for whatever reason, then please go through the recordings because in this course, if you miss one lecture, then uh, certain terms, if I've introduced in that lecture, you will not be able to understand and uh, keep track of. So please, if you miss a lecture, try to attend the lecture in the recording, which also means I have to put up the recording quickly, uh, which I'll try to do. Certainly for the first three lectures, I will, uh, I will put up a uh, recording. Sir? Yeah. Sir, for this quasar spectrum part, so uh, which books should be uh, referred to? Uh, so this is from one specific paper. Uh, Vandenberg's uh, paper. Uh, if you want a very detailed introduction uh, to lines, uh, I think the book by Julian Krolik. So if you go to the website, uh, I have uh, listed a number of papers, uh, sorry, books there. There is a book uh, by Julian Krolik uh, titled Active Galactic Nuclei. And that book is the most sort of detailed book. Like Bini and Tremaine is for galaxy dynamics, like one standard book. Uh, like that, you have uh, Julian Krolik's uh, Active Galactic Nuclei that really covers everything. It'll, it'll talk in great detail about all of these uh, emission lines. Otherwise, you, you just learn about it. I mean, if you are an actual researcher, you don't actually go and study all the lines uh, that there are, right? You just go and study the object that you want to understand and see what lines you see. Uh, I've shown you the composite spectrum. So it just shows you average lines. So there may be uh, different quasars which contain lines which are not listed here, right? But there could also be uh, quasars which have very, very different uh, uh, relative strengths of the two lines, of the various lines. So there may be quasars which have weaker end to emission and there may be others which are very strong. Like this one uh, particular one seems to have very strong end to emission, almost comparable to, to H1. So it depends. And so next time I will introduce a concept called equivalent width. Uh, that will help you understand uh, which lines are important and which are not. And of course, you don't have to do identification of lines by hand. Uh, there is software that does it automatically for you. So you just feed it a spectrum. Uh, it'll calculate the best fit redshift and it will also calculate, try and identify the lines and measure their equivalent weights. Thank you, sir. So, and regarding the website where you will be uh, sharing these lectures, yes. So, um, so have you shared the link by email because I haven't received anything? No, no, no. I have not. So, uh, I had it uh, on my first uh, talk. So, maybe I will just uh, do one thing. I will just share that slide. Uh, I can also do uh, an email. I have to make an email list anyway. But this is the website. Uh, you can note it down if you want. Uh, all right, sir. Take a screenshot. Thank yeah, you. great. So uh, there you will find the PDFs of the lectures. I'll also put the recordings of the lectures. And I will also, uh, all the assignments, the two assignments that you're going to get will also be put there. And there's a list of books. I'll also put in a list of uh, important research papers. Uh, many of these will be from the list of seminar papers. So what I'm going to do, start doing now, remember you have a 30 mark, 30% uh, uh, weightage for an online seminar towards the end of the course. Uh, so for that, by this weekend, I will uh, put up a list of sort of important papers uh, uh, in the field of AGN. And I, will, I know all of you have sort of different interests so I'll put, put in some real theoretical papers. I'll also put in some observational papers. Uh, so you can choose uh, whichever you like best. Yeah, anyway, so uh, this is the URL of the website.
and uh, once i create a mailing list uh, i'll i'll send it out i mean certainly before i send you the assignment i have to create a mailing list okay sounds good okay so we'll meet again next on monday at 11:30 same time bye bye